So uh, you should now uh, uh, brace yourself yourselves for an action movie from ETH uh, Zurich. Uh, this is um, a, a paper on uh, formally verified optimized monitor for metric first order dynamic logic with, with many authors from ETH Zurich and uh, many presenters. So this is highly interactive. I'm going to play the, um, uh, the movie for you. And then the actors and directors of the movie will also be here to answer questions at the end. The presentation is organized as a drama in four acts, featuring the conversations between the authors of the paper. The conversations take place in several facilities of the VASA Space Agency. We will meet Dimitri, a rocket engineer, Joshua, a monitoring researcher, Sergen, a work informalizer, and Martin, a QA engineer. Hi, Joshua. I recently heard you talking about runtime verification and monitoring. Can you tell me more? Sure. Why are you asking? Well, as you know, we are building this robot that will fly to Mars. There is a lot of complicated software in the communication modules. You can imagine that these modules are absolutely critical for the mission, and we need to be sure that they function properly. So I guess you're testing the software thoroughly? Of course. But our engineers want to check some policies that you cannot simply write as an assertion in some unit test. For example, there are some forbidden behaviors that one can detect only by observing several modules over time. Interesting. That indeed sounds like a perfect application for monitoring. Can you observe somehow what's going on in the modules? We have detailed event logs, yes. Great. That's the first input we need for monitoring. The second input is a formal specification of the policies. How would that would look like? Well, there are many different formalisms. One powerful tool that I'm familiar with is called Mompoli. It uses metric first order temporal logic, or MFOTL for short. It is a temporal logic, so you can express properties that relate different points in time. Let me briefly show you its features using its syntax. So you may recognize the temporal operators from LTL, which is next, previous, since, and until. As you can see, we both have past and future versions of them. The temporal operators also carry these intervals, which you can use to restrict the range of the operators in time. MFOTL is interpreted over first order structures. That means that the events can carry data or parameters and we can quantify over this data. Monopoly also supports aggregations such as maximum, minimum, count and so on, similar to those that you have in SQL. Here, let me briefly show you some examples. So with MFOTL, you can easily formalize policy such as published reports must have been approved in the past seven days. The corresponding formula you can see here. For every published report R, there must have been once in the past, that's the black diamond operator, a corresponding approval. And note how we use the variable R to match the events of one report. With aggregations, we can express properties such as the maximum radiation must not exceed three Röntgen. And here you can read the formula as follows. Whenever M is this maximum radiation X, then M must be at most three. So the monitor takes the specification and the events one by one and checks them, right? Yes. But how do you know that the monitor itself is correct, though? Ah, we actually have another tool called Verimon, which has been formalized and proved correct in the Isabel Hall proof assistant. Perfect. So I would use Verimon then. Let me show you two simple policies that I want to monitor. First, the robot must not start to move if three or more transmissions of the same data failed within the last 10 minutes without a successful transmission in between. And second, the module with the highest energy consumption must be reported to ground control within one minute. 
Well, I think there is a problem. As you can see here on the right, very modern specification language is actually a proper subset of Monpolis language. In particular, aggregations are not supported and you need those for your second property. And the first policy cannot be expressed nicely in Monpoly either. Especially if you do not want to use aggregations, the encoding becomes completely infeasible. The formula is just huge. And to be honest, the performance of Verriman is not great. That's a shame. Now that I think about it, doesn't the first policy look like a simple regular expression? You could just search for three failed transmissions followed by a move and check the timestamps. So what's the difficulty for you monitoring people? Hmm, you may be onto something. So there is this rocket guy who gave me a policy and I have a lot of trouble formalizing it in MFOTL. Maybe you can help me with that. The specification is that the robot must not start to move if three or more transmissions of the same data failed in a row within the last 10 minutes. So here is my formalization attempt. The idea is to partition the events into three groups, starting with a failed communication and then no successes in between. So in the formula, I'm using three nested since operators to express this. But I also need to ensure that the total time of this pattern is at most 10 minutes. I can only annotate individual since operators with an interval. So I have to look at all possible decompositions of this time interval. Here I'm writing this as a big meta disjunction, but that causes the size of the formula to blow up. And also we are lucky that discrete timestamps are sufficient for the specification. Otherwise, this formalization, formalization would just not work. The problem is that this temporal pattern requires us to both nest temporal operators and ensure that the overall time interval is within 10 minutes. Here is an elegant solution. What if we could use regular expressions to express temporal patterns? This new operator is called past match and it allows us to write temporal patterns as regular expressions and specify the overall time interval that matches must satisfy. In the case of this past match operator, the pattern matches the current position i to some past position j. This is great. Let me try to formalize the first policy now. So here I'm writing a regular expression for the pattern of three failures, each followed by arbitrary events where the transmission does not succeed. And then I wrap the regular expression in a single past match operator that enforces the metric constraint. The nice thing about this formula is that it needs only one temporal construct and is therefore much smaller than the encoding in mfoddle. Let's call this language with the new operator mfoddle with DL standing for dynamic logic, like in linear dynamic logic proposed by the Giacomo and Vardi in 2013. Here is the full syntax of mfoddle. Besides the existing mfoddle operators, uh, one can also use regular expressions for both past and future temporal patterns. And regular expressions can be wildcard, which matches any letter, a test which checks if, an, uh, if a formula holds, alternation, concatenation, and clean star, which have standard semantics. And what are the atomic letters in the regular expressions? Are they a set of events? They can be actually any mfoddle formula. The formulas and regular expressions are mutually ex recursive in mfoddle. Uh-huh. So I quickly looked at the formal semantics, and I saw that the test construct does not consume any event from the input. So the current position in the input stays the same. One would rather expect that the test consumes one unit of the input. Well, we can introduce this as a syntactic sugar. The intuition holds if you combine the test with the wildcard as so, or with their positions, uh, the test and the wildcard specifically, exchanged in the context of the future match operator. Also, we can use this kind of tricks to embed 
MFOTL operators in MFOTL as so. I see. And how do you evaluate the regular expressions in your monitor? That's a good question. Let's extend Veriman's evaluation algorithms in Isabel. For most, we would like to ensure that the algorithm is correct, right? Let me quickly recap the main idea behind Veriman's evaluation algorithm first. To evaluate this formula, A, X, Y, and not B, Y, or C, X, Y, over, a finite pre over finite predicates A, B, and C, Veriman keeps finite tables of satisfying valuations for each subformula. The evaluation starts with tables at the leaves, which are read from the, from the log, and table columns in this case correspond to free variables of the subformula they're referring to. The evaluation proceeds bottom up using table operation like join, used for concatenation, and table union, which is used for disjunction. The valuations on, at the top level uh, of the formula are reported as the monitor's output. Conceptually, it's not, it's not the case that every subformula has a finite table of valuations. Look at the not B, Y subformula, for example. But we ensure that such formulas occur in a finite context, for example, in a conjunction with A, X, Y. And the entire context is then evaluated as a whole. We say that not B, Y is guarded by A, X, Y, and we use the anti-join table operation in this case. The necessity to use finite tables and uh, table operations induces a syntactic fragment that uh, can be monitored. This fragment is defined under the following conditions. Conjunction uses a join and it's unrestricted. The negation must be guarded by a conjunction with a finite table. The anti-join which is used in this case requires that columns of the negated formula, in this case beta, are contained in uh, the formula that is part of the conjunction alpha. Disjunction uses table union, which requires that all table columns are the same. And similarly, one can write other constraints for other uh, language constructs, depending on the specific uh, uh, semantics of these constructs. So I guess you will use join, anti-join, and union, and finite tables to evaluate regular expressions as well. But surely you need some syntactic restrictions for mfodl too. Yes, though similar, the restriction is not as intuitive as the, the mfotl one that we uh, talked, so we, we explained just now. Let me explain this on three examples. For simplicity, all intervals used in, in the examples are from zero to infinity. So first, let's consider valuations V at position I in the log of a past match operator uh, with top level clean star regular expression. Since clean star always matches an empty pattern, uh, i.e. it matches uh, from position i to position i again, um, the evaluation of free variables uh, that satisfy this formula are any. So any evaluations of free variables of r are evaluations that satisfy this overall formula. Hence, in this case, the corresponding uh, table of valuations for the formula is infinite. And like in the case of negation that we saw previously, clean star must be guarded. Similarly, like for disjunction, we need to consider union of satisfying valuations of two alternative regular expressions. In the example on the right, the valuation of, of the alternation is the union of the table with the valuation of the R match, which is shown uh, below the line, and its counterpart for the S match shown above in the line. Hence, to perform the union, the two alternatives need to have the same uh, free variables. And finally, consider the concatenation. One would be tempted to treat it as a conjunction and just use a join. However, it hides a union if S matches an empty pattern in this case. In the example valuation uh, on the right, uh, valuation V is the union of two cases. The first case is where both R and S have non-trivial matches and then they are joined. 
And the other case is where only R has a non-trivial match, while S matches an empty pattern. Therefore, free variables of S must be contained in free variables of R. And you can imagine now that the idea is symmetric for future match operators. That's pretty great. But what about expressing the second policy? You know, the one with the aggregation. Right, so let's call the new monitor Verimon Plus. Overall, it supports all of the Monpolis constructs. We effectively bridge the expressiveness gap between, between the tools. And in fact, Verimon Plus supports even more constructs now if you consider the regular expressions. So the second policy is just expressed as the same way as in Monpoly using aggregations. I just hope that Verimon Plus is as efficient as Monpoly is. <laughs> benchmark the following m formula. Unfortunately, Monpoly outperforms Verimon by a large margin. Verimon even produces a stack overflow if we throw more than 200 events per second at it. Have you looked into why is this the case? Yes, I have inspected how the synths and until operators are handled in Verimon and realized that they can be further optimized. Sounds great. Can you explain the optimizations to me? Let me first recall how the synth operator is handled in Verimon. Consider the formula Rx since Tx, and let me call Ti and Ri the tables of satisfying valuations as position i associated with the subformulas Rx and Tx. The data structure for this formula after processing a position n consists of the tables Tj joined with the subsequent tables Rj plus 1 up to Rn for all tables Tj within the interval. These are marked gray and up to the current position n. These are marked white. The result for the overall formula at the current position n is then computed by taking the union of the gray tables within the interval. To update the data structure after receiving the tables at the next position n plus 1, the algorithm works as follows. First, some tables may fall out of the interval based on the new timestamp and are ignored from then on. Sometimes new tables may also enter the interval, but let us for simplicity assume that this is not the case. All the remaining tables are joined with the table Rn plus 1. Then the new table Tn plus 1 is added to the data structure. Finally, the result for the SIDS operator is computed by taking the union of the joint tables within the interval. As we see in the diagram, the number of joint operations that have been performed can be quadratic in the number of process positions, and computing the union requires a linear pass through the joint tables. So I propose to store the union of the joint tables within the interval directly. Thereby, we use the Horner scheme paradigm for joints and unions to reduce the number of joints. However, a complication arises from the need to incrementally update the union. To this end, we also store the original input tables Tj. This is a trade-off. The size of the original tables Tj can be bigger than the size of the joint tables, but storing them allows us to efficiently handle tables that fall out of the interval. And for the Horner scheme table, we additionally associate to each of its tuples the most recent position at which the tuple occurs in the respective joint table. The join is handled by filtering this mapping from tuples to positions. New tables are handled by adding them to the list of tables. Finally, to handle tables that enter the interval, we also store a second mapping of each tuple to the least recent position at which it occurs in any joint table. What is the effect of the optimizations on your formula? In my draft implementation, they improved the running time quite a lot, but Verimon is still slower than Monpoly. Is there something else that we can improve? I've heard of this recent multi-way join trend in the database community. Verimon evaluates the three-way join in the example formula as a sequence of two binary joins. This is also what a traditional database would do, except that it would also use the information available about the three tables to decide which two tables to join first. Often, however, neither of the two options is efficient because the result of this first join is much larger than the overall result. A multi-way join is designed to handle the freeway join natively and thus avoid large intermediate results. The multi-way join algorithm is even worst case optimal. That is, for any query, there exists a database instance such that the algorithm never constructs an intermediate result that is larger than the overall result. 
Let me implement it quickly and run my benchmark. Combining multi-way joints and my sliding window optimization, Verimon Plus outperforms Monopoly. Very good. Let's prove that these optimizations are correct and show the optimized tool to Dmitry. Hi, Dmitry. I have prepared some demo for you. I heard that you are interested in aggregations, in particular the following specification. The module with the highest energy consumption within the second to last minute must be reported to ground control. Here is how I formalized it. The first conjunct computes the value of the highest energy consumption of any module, while the second conjunct selects the actual modules exhibiting the highest energy consumption. This is how you write it in Verimon Plus. I am now going to check if the property holds on the following log of events that your robot could have produced. I also need to prepare a signature file describing the predicates in the policy. Finally, we are ready to invoke Verimon Plus. The output shows the modules along with their highest energy consumption. For instance, the first line shows that at timestamp 170, the GPS module exhibited the highest energy consumption between the timestamps 50 to 110, and the value was 30. I see two problems. First, you said Verimon Plus, but you typed Monopoly. And second, shouldn't there also be an output at the timestamp 230? Indeed, I keep confusing Monopoly and Verimon Plus. Fortunately, Verimon Plus has the same interface, so I can easily fix that. Oops, you're right. I am quite convinced that the output of Verimon Plus is correct because it is verified. So it looks like a bug in Monopoly. I will need to further investigate this. This is quite impressive and confirms the value of formal proofs. You should submit a paper to each car. I heard they might be interested in such insights. I will consider that. To get clearance for going to space with it, I need to pitch Verimon Plus to my supervisor. Can I say that Verimon Plus is the most correct, the most expressive, and the most efficient tool out there? Such a universal statement sounds quite unlikely in my humble opinion. Okay, I will just say that this is certainly correct. After all, it has been verified in Isabel. I will also say that it is expressive. It supports a superset of Monopoly specification language, and Monopoly is considered state of the art. And it is efficient. It integrates interesting verified optimizations, which are unprecedented in monitoring algorithms. I've heard that taking these together, Verimon Plus can even outperform the unverified Monopoly tool. All true, but there is always more to do among all these axes. Regarding correctness, we used Monopoly's unverified formula and log parsers. It would be good to also prove them correct. Also, we used purely functional algorithms in Verimon Plus. It is certainly worthwhile to refine them to imperative ones, such that we can benefit from Isabel's extraction to LLVM, developed by Lamich. I look forward to these improvements, but expressiveness-wise, it is perfect, isn't it? Remember that there were some restrictions on the formulas Verimon Plus can handle, where negation can occur and what free variables subformulas need to have. We are working on dropping these restrictions. We call such formulas unsafe. An example is this formula. Px or there exists y, ry, where even if the tables in the log are all finite, the result can be infinite. Thus, we need to move away from using finite tables to represent sets of satisfying valuations to support such formulas. Furthermore, we have also implemented a let operator that forces sharing during evaluation. Although a simple let operator does not extend expressiveness, it promotes efficiency and is the first step towards a recursive let operator, which would actually extend the expressiveness beyond first order logic. Could you show me an example of a property you could define using the recursive let expression? For instance, you could compute the transitive closure of a predicate. You have already touched upon efficiency. Are there other ways to improve the performance? 
it would be useful to generalize the sliding window algorithm from the temporal operators since and until to past and future match operators. These operators are evaluated rather naively in Verimon Plus. You can express since as the following past match operator. Hence, this particular regular expression can certainly be handled more efficiently using the current sliding window algorithm. Likely, other expressions can be handled more efficiently too. We also want to optimize the computation of aggregations over temporal formulas. For instance, computing the moving average does not require to recompute the average from scratch at each position, which the current algorithm does. Looks like you've done a lot. I look forward to reading your Ichkar paper. But there is even more to be done. Maybe I can help you there. Absolutely. Everybody is welcome to join. Thank you very much for this exciting research movie. So are there any questions? Um, Andre, I think Martin is also there. So if you promote him to panelist, he can also. Right, right. Just, just one second. Thanks. I, yeah, the problem is that I don't have control during the presentation. I don't have control on the, on Zoom. <laughs> Did I manage to? Looks good. Do we have Martin with us? OK. All right. So I, I hope I'm not I'm not missing the because I, I don't know where the uh, hand hand rising will pop up. I just hope it will pop up somewhere. So if you are raising your hand and I cannot see it, please just type a message in the Q&A for me. Uh, let, me start, let me start with a question. So how do you keep this? Uh, what are the challenges at keeping this uh, correct, expressive, and efficient? Um, so you have, you have quite, quite, quite a lot of things in there, right? So first of all, you have the code extraction uh, to, uh, you have the, the uh, specification and verification is available, you have the code extraction to OCaml, and you keep coming up with, with optimizations, right? So how do you regard this, this, this effort of maintaining it essentially to the status that it has now, uh, maintaining uh, the system very one plus? Who will take the question? Um, Martin, that's one, that's one, that one is for you. Aha, uh -huh. okay, just in time. Can you say something? We don't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, maybe I will answer the question then. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, the first version of the algorithms that we wrote was the most naive one. Um, and then indeed we started replacing them one by one with more sophisticated uh, optimizations. Um, and I think we, yeah, so far we worked quite ad hoc in, in an ad hoc way, uh, using different ways to replace uh, different parts. But now uh, methodology starts to emerge. Namely, we use a locale to uh, more or less describe what the naive algorithm does, uh, and then have a Break, break the naive da algorithm down into operations that we then replace one by one with something more efficient. Um, but yeah, we have not stressed this aspect too much in the paper. We show one locale how, how we did that, but uh, we do not present this as a methodology yet to doing like not data refinement, but more structural refinement of, uh, of the algorithm. Okay, sounds like a, an, an emerging methodology. Yeah. Let me see. Okay, so um, I, I I actually have some questions, so um, I I will continue. Um, 
I, I, I regard I encounter this problem in my work uh, with with uh, uh, justifying this step from something that is verified in Isabel towards the the guarantees that you offer for the extracted OCaml code, which is um, essentially at least in theory, it depends on the kind of properties that you prove for the for the uh, Isabel version of the code. So what are your thoughts here? How, how is this? How, how do the properties transfer along this this code generation? I mean, one problem certainly is that uh, the code generation only if you trust the code generator, it only guarantees partial correctness. Exactly. We actually saw that with the uh, stack overflows that we got from the first version of Verimon. So it was possible okay. that it just crashed and didn't give you any result. And that's kind of fine from the perspective of the code generator. Um, but it's true that the code generation itself is not verified. And um, it would be nice to integrate with um, some of the efforts that other researchers have made towards certifying this step. Um, we mentioned the uh, export to LLVM in the context of optimization, but that would actually allow us to extend this chain of verification to a lower level. Still, there would probably be some LLVM assembler that had to be trusted, but it would be on a lower level. Um, there are, of course, projects like KML, um, which I think there is a path now from Isabel Hall where you can exactly, yeah. get there. Um, we, so far, we haven't tried to use that. But if you really want the most confidence, then yeah, this is the path to go, path to take, I think. OK, yeah, th this is interesting because, uh, of course, officially, it's, it's partial correctness, the type of guarantees um, uh, qualifies partial correctness. but in effect, if you if you restrict your your work to a certain fragment of Isabel, which you probably do, you can really uh, uh, count on a higher level of of uh, assurance. So it really goes beyond uh, partial correctness. It's just that this needs to be expressed carefully, and um, um, you need to pair it with a certain acknowledgement of the fact that you are using a, a restricted fragment of of Isabel. And of course, that becomes quite complicated if you have a lot of uh, Isabel code to look at. Absolutely. OK. Are there other questions? All right. So if there are no more questions, thank you again for this exciting talk. <laughs>